morning. This is Bill Lapini, Superintendent of Schools here in Brookline, and uh, we're honored today to have an opportunity to have a conversation with the Governor. Governor Patrick, thank you for thank joining you. us. Thank you. It's my honor to be with you. Thank, thank you. you. So um, I think we want to talk some about the, the package that you've put forward, the budget package, Great. particularly the, the, um, the aspects of it that deal with education and mm -hmm. transportation. Mm -hmm. So could you, could you lay out um, exactly what we'd be looking at for our public schools, schools here in Brookline in the, um, in the education? Well, budget? it's a, Bill, it's a, it's a growth strategy. It's a growth budget. It's about investing in the things we know make our uh, community stronger today, but also for a generation to come. So in education, for example, where we have uh, led the nation in student achievement, and that's not by accident, it's because we have uh, invested uh, time and ideas and creativity and money uh, in, uh, in enabling us to do so, we still have an achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And the kids who are stuck in that gap, as you know better than most, are, uh, th are poor, uh, kids with special needs, kids who speak English as a second language. There are kids, too. Uh, and there's some strategies that, uh, that we know work in terms of early education investments, uh, quality early edu education that helps assure reading proficiency by third grade, for example, uh, longer school day in middle school years, which is something that middle schoolers hate when I talk about, but actually is a proven strategy in high-need schools. And college affordability is another uh, dimension uh, of that. And then on the transportation side, same thing. We need a 21st century transportation network. These aren't my ideas. These are the ideas that are coming from the people we serve. We need a T that is safe and functioning and runs late, uh, you know, until 2 in the morning. Uh, we need a, a, a commuter rail system that is complete and reaches parts of the Commonwealth that have been cut off economically. We need safe roads and bridges and good ferry systems and so forth, and we need that uh, kind of equitable investment across the whole of the Commonwealth, not just concentrated in downtown Boston, as important as that is. And all of that costs money. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're trying to have a, uh, a conversation with uh, people of the Commonwealth uh, where people don't go immediately to their usual rhetorical corners, but instead um, deal with facts and make choices. And the choice that I am advocating is one uh, that favors growth. So why now? I mean, some people have argued that, that this is not the time yeah. for this kind of a package, yeah. um, that, that our economy can't withstand it, that we aren't ready for this. Well, first of all, I think our economy is hungry for growth, just like our households are and, uh, and individuals are hungry for growth. And we've done comparatively well uh, coming out of recession uh, faster than most other states and growing at nearly twice the national growth rate. That's because we've been able to invest in education and innovation and infrastructure mm -hmm. at the levels we have. If we want to accelerate that, we're going to have to invest some more. And by the way, Bill, you know, folks will always say there's not a good time for taxes. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, uh, it's not something I ask lightly. I certainly understand that the impact of the recession is still being felt by many, many families. Mm -hmm. And no matter what the economists say about the recession being uh, uh, technically over, mm -hmm. um, if it isn't over in your own house, it's not over. Mm -hmm. I, I completely get that. But I also think that, um, you know, a generation before mine, uh, I, I won't say ours, mine, I'm a baby boomer, um, you know, they made decisions and sacrifices so that we could have the infrastructure we have. Mm -hmm. I drive, we drive on the pike because they made sacrifices uh, in their time. And it seems to me our generation has to, has to step up too uh, for, uh, to make the same kinds of sacrifices, reasonable ones um, that are about a discipline of investment over time that make our communities stronger, that grow jobs, and that strengthen the Commonwealth for a generation to come. So our district has certainly benefited from a number of the ideas that you've put forward over I the hope years, so. and, we, and we really appreciate Thank that. You. So what, what happens in, in Brookline as a result of these proposals? Well, I think uh, Brookline sees a, uh, a more reliable and safer T, a more modern, modern uh, uh, T. Uh, everybody benefits from better roads and bridges and, uh, and so forth. Um, strategies that work uh, wherever there are kids uh, who are being left um, behind will work in Brookline in those cases where there are kids being left behind. And uh, some of that is about new resources, but also some of it's about uh, new ideas mm -hmm. and, and flexibilities in, uh, uh, in schools. So, you know, this isn't about, um, it isn't about any one population mm -hmm. or, or, or one community as important and wonderful as Brookline, uh, Brookline is, and it's a perfectly fair question sort of what's in it for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. But part of, the, part of the conversation we're trying to engender right now as citizens is 
is to ask what's in it for us mm -hmm. and that how do we express the stake that we have in our neighbors' dreams and struggles mm -hmm. as well as our own. We, d we do know, we've, we've examined it closely, the proposal mm -hmm. closely, and we appreciate a number of the, number of the aspects of the proposal. I feel a butt coming. No, 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 <laughs> no, one, one piece that's there is, is really the, the raising of the floor for those minimum aid communities. This is one of those communities. Mm -hmm. And some have said over the past weeks to us that, that that's part of what makes the proposal difficult mm. in that there are communities like Brookline and Newton and Wellesley that benefit um, from 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 the the increase in that floor that much that some part of the money goes to to funding that floor right well I've heard that um, you know I, I, I've there are a lot of uh, sort of urban myths about how a wash in resources Brookline and Newton and and a handful of other mm. uh, communities are I know some of those realities uh, are not quite uh, consistent with those uh, right. um, with uh, with those myths and you know we have had for a long time, on long before I was governor, an over-reliance on the property tax in, uh, in our cities and towns. And that has to do with the, with the relationship between local aid, uh, unrestricted, and Chapter 70, the support for the schools, um, and, uh, and, and needs at the, local, at the local level. So to the extent we have tried a number of different strategies to try to take the pressure off the property tax, which is a fundamentally you know, regressive tax. Mm -hmm. It's a tax that uh, you have to pay whether you have any cash or not. A lot of people are, you know the old expression, house rich? Um, mm -hmm. They own the house, they have value in that, but they're on a fixed income or they're out of work. It's really hard to pay that uh, property tax. So trying to, this is a part, and it's one of a number of steps we've taken over the last six years to try to right that balance. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a balance that ma matters in Brookline too. Mm -hmm. Um, over the, n the past number of years, I had many opportunities to work with um, Secretary Revel. Um, Wasn't in he the great? Position. Terrific, yeah. terrific. And um, really, this, this community, this school district, um, personally, I benefited from, from, from that relationship. I appreciate you saying that. Could you, could you talk about some of the accomplishments, um, some of the major accomplishments during that time? And, and as Secretary Malone takes over, one of... Uh, one of my co former colleagues Indeed. in the superintendency, Indeed. what some of the challenges are that you think uh, the administration and the secretary face? Well, I think, I think um, that the, you know, it's a cliche to talk about leaving no child uh, behind. Um, but again, as well as we have done number one in the nation in student achievement for each of the last five or six years, we have had a persistent achievement gap, as mm -hmm. I said. And I described the kids who have been stuck in that achievement gap and to let it go for 20 years, really, um, while we've been working on raising standards and raising expectations and performance of, uh, of all children, to let that uh, achievement gap persist as it has is not just a, an economic and a social question, it's a moral question. Mm -hmm. um, because as I say, those, those are our children too, those are Commonwealth children. So the work that uh, led by the Secretary around the Achievement Gap Act, which uh, I was proud to sign in 2010, mm -hmm was huge. Mm -hmm. New rules, new tools, new flexibilities, new accountabilities um, to be able to begin to tailor uh, educational responses for the particular population of children that a school is dealing with. Indeed, for the particular individual student, um, because uh, not every solution is going to be right in every place. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very proud of that, and I know that uh, I know that Secretary Revel was mm -hmm. as well. We were the highest scorer in the President's Race to the Top initiative. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of that. We went back and competed and succeeded for uh, the the early education equivalent of Race to the Top. Um, again, Secretary Revel leading the mm -hmm. uh, leading the charge there, and we had a um, we had a uh, significant uh, reform of the community college system mm -hmm. to try to get our uh, 14 or 15 community colleges to actually act like a system and be uh, more robust partners consistently, I guess is the way to put it, mm -hmm. in, uh, in the workforce meeting the workforce development needs around the, uh, around the Commonwealth. So a really visionary and very effective uh, secretary, and he Absolutely. is succeeded by a protege of, of his own mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in Matt Malone, who I know will carry on that good work. Great. Um, what what bring? I mean, I heard you speak when you were um, running for office the first time at the superintendents conference I a remember number that. of years ago. I remember that. And and Early people days. people people felt um, that they just saw a certain enthusiasm, a certain twinkle in your eye when you talked about um, issues that we all share in education. And I've read some 
about 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 what brings you brings that passion to your work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I you know education um, is transformative for many of us. It certainly it certainly was for me. As you know, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, not the not generally viewed as the garden spot. And I lived there with my mother and my sister and my grandparents and various relatives who came and went in our grandparents' two-bedroom tenement. My mother and sister and I shared one of those bedrooms in a set of bunk beds. So you go from the top bunk to the bottom bunk to the floor every third night on the floor. Mm -hmm. The schools I went to in Chicago were big and broken and under-resourced and, uh, uh, and overcrowded and sometimes violent. Um, in, uh, in, in middle school, what we called then upper grade center, we had 40 kids in every classroom and police at every intersection in the, uh, in the, uh, in the building because the so-called Woodlawn riots had just come through mm -hmm. the, uh, so this is way back in the dark ages in, uh, in 1968. Um, but there were inspired teachers in those classrooms. And I remember a sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Quaintance, who, uh, taught us to, uh, to count and, and uh, say the greetings in German. She took us to the first opera I'd ever seen. Mm. Uh, she, uh, she, there was a new movie out at the time called The Sound of Music, and mm. she took us to, s to see it um, and used it as a jumping off point to teach us about the rise of the Nazis and, uh, and, uh, and the Second World War. She was the first person who ever helped me imagine what it would be like to be a citizen of the world. Mm. And you have to you have to appreciate for a kid on the south side of Chicago that's a huge yeah. gift, and she stayed in my life until she passed away uh, a few years ago. She was present when I graduated from college, the first in my family to do so. When I graduated from law school, when I was sworn in at the Justice Department, when I was married, um, she would have been at our uh, at my uh, inauguration had she lived. My third grade teacher was present mm. uh, at uh, at my inauguration, and I think I take from them. And from that experience, two things. Number one, that the very best thing we can do to make a school sing is assure that there is a well-prepared, well-supported teacher in front of those children who loves those children, who loves them, who is completely invested in their uh, success. And I think there's some strategies we have learned here in Massachusetts and elsewhere about how to do that better. And the second thing is that um, uh, that, you know, there are there is talent in every community, every single community. And who gets a chance? I got a chance to go to Milton Academy. That's not a chance everybody's going to get or even most kids are going to get. Um, who gets a chance depends on us and whether we do things in our time that create those kinds of environments where that talent m meets its full potential. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're sitting here as a community after you've put out House One, and and we're wrestling with this process that we go through. <laughs> you are wrestling well, with it. <laughs> so we're all wrestling Indeed. with this process, Indeed. right? And and so we're we're looking at this as a community that's growing. I know you know a little bit about our community, and mm -hmm. we're one of percentage-wise one of the fastest growing school systems in the Commonwealth. We've gone from 5,700 students pre-K through 12 to about 7,200 students in the last eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. And so that growth is, is, is eating into our operating budget. And we're, we're looking at House One and local revenues and all and trying to figure out how we add teachers in, in what could be a reduction in other services. Mm -hmm. So w what, what do we do with, um, with the proposal? And, and, and what's yet to come from the House and the Senate? How would, how would you advise a well, local Well, a couple things I forward? would say. First of all, I, I'm not pretending that what I have proposed in this budget is the, is the be all and end all, is the mm -hmm. panacea. Um, for uh, all of what ails Brookline or other cities and towns. I do know, and I'm absolutely certain of this, that investing in education and investing in infrastructure, particularly in transportation, is a winning growth strategy. Mm -hmm. And that's been proven in our history, in our national uh, history, and, and, uh, and elsewhere. So it is worth fighting for. There is more. We're proposing to raise about $2 billion in new revenue um, dedicated to these two things. Mm -hmm. There's more than one way to do it. I propose to do it by cutting the sales tax from six and a quarter to four point five percent, and dedicating all transportation, excuse me, all sales tax revenue to public infrastructure, um, transportation, school building assistance, mm -hmm. and, and so forth, and then raising the income tax to uh, by a percentage point to six and a quarter percent, doubling the exemption so the threshold where the income tax kicks in is higher. And it actually means, taken together, that folks who are uh, who make about forty thousand or less pay less 
in taxes. Mm -hmm. People in the forty to sixty thousand dollar range pay about the same, and for those uh, sixty thousand up, pay more depending on their ability to do so. So we get a little progressivity in it. That's my view. Mm -hmm. There may be other ways to do it, but rather than um, do what we usually do, which is you know flee the question. Uh, of, uh, of what civilization costs, what the kind of com commonwealth we want actually costs. Uh, and as I say, said earlier, retreat to our typical rhetorical mm -hmm. um, uh, corners, is to get people to focus on the what and the why before the how. Mm -hmm. What are we trying to do? I've described it in transportation mm -hmm. and in education. Why are we trying to do it? Because growth is critical. Why is growth critical? Because opportunity is central to who we are and growth is necessary for opportunity, and investment is what creates growth, not waiting for it, not hoping for it, investing, uh, investing in it. And so I'm open to the long way around to your question. Mm -hmm. I'm open to different ways of raising that $2 billion. The, I've put my proposal uh, forward. The House has its chance uh, soon to start to pick that apart and mm -hmm. fret over it and come up with other uh, solutions, uh, and uh, we'll be engaged with them as they do. Uh, and then the Senate will get their chance. And I, I guess what I would say to you and to other citizens is you need to engage too. Have the com first of all, be informed. Mm -hmm. Go on the, uh, on the mass.gov website. You can get all the data about what's in the proposal, where it comes from. You can see the details of the transportation plan. You can see where the investments are in different parts of the Commonwealth that we're planning to do over the next uh, uh, 10 years. You can see what's underneath the education uh, uh, proposal and even some references to the research that backs it up. Uh, and then engage with your representatives and senators, call the speaker and the Senate president, um, and if nothing more, leave a message saying, let's make this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it matters, it mm -hmm. really does uh, matter. And they count the number of calls and, <laughs> and, uh, and letters they get. Can I ask, I, I wanna ask you two questions that are, that are really um, central to Brookline and, and, and that growth in some of our programs. Mm -hmm. I wanna ask you about the school building authority, the yep. School Building Authority, co when it came into play, was a was a radical change from mm -hmm. what had been in place before. I think it's worked well, though, don't you? Well, that's what I was going to ask yeah. you. I, we think it's worked very well. We've had two projects go through that mm -hmm. um, that process. They've worked ver out very well. The re renovation of the Runkle School and the Heath School, and mm -hmm. we're engaged with them now on the Devotion School. And I was going to ask you how 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 do you think that's worked? I think it's worked very well, and I get I get those uh, I, I get reports from. Uh, superintendents all over the all over the Commonwealth. You know, not everybody is getting everything they want, right. uh, or as quickly as they right. as they want. But compared to what used to happen, I gather, um, some ten years or, or mm. more ago, right. it's very businesslike. It's very orderly. It's very transparent, yes. uh, and uh, and it is uh, it is predictable in the sense that you'll get a yes or no answer right. pretty quickly. It's made on the merits, and that's uh, and that's that. Right. And I think with the proposal we have made to dedicate all sales tax revenue to public infra infrastructure, we may be able to do a little bit better mm -hmm. um, by the by the school building assistance fund than we've been able to do in the past. Well, as I said, it's done it's done very well by us here, and, and we appreciate that. Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, can I ask you about um, Metco? Yeah. We we um, so we're a Metco community. Yes, we're the indeed. second largest program mm -hmm. in the Commonwealth. Um, can you talk a little bit about y your your vision for Metco, where you see? I think Metco is great. I, you know, I, I I've uh, I, I used to say to the uh, uh, to the founder of Metco, whom I adore and is a is a, a force to be reckoned yes, with. Yes, she is. Uh, <laughs> an incredible, incredible advocate. That um, Metco essentially um, uh, and ironically, in a way, asks the children to do what the adults wouldn't. You know, the uh, the adults. Uh, uh, haven't integrated the neighborhoods, so mm -hmm. we send in the kids to integrate the, uh, the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, it has had such a value for the, uh, for the Medco students and for the students in the host community, yes. um, as diversity does. So uh, um, power to it. We're trying to do our best um, by it. They have, they have been touched by cuts we've mm -hmm. had to do throughout the budget mm -hmm. in, the worst of, uh, in the worst of times. But I see a continuing value for Medco, and I think most legislators do too. So I want to ask you about the, uh, the transportation part of your proposals, mm -hmm. and and you you said there's a uh, there is some some work in the infrastructure in in the greater Boston area, but mm -hmm. there's a but there's a great deal of work that will occur out of that area. Correct. Do you, you want to talk a little bit about? Well, that? so this this is uh, what I describe as sort of regional equ equity, because um, one of the one of the truths about the Big Dig, um, which is you know. 
I'm a frustrated architect, so <laughs> I actually love the Big Dig. It's an amazing engineering accomplishment. I like it. I uh, liked it better at $5 billion mm. than $22 billion. Mm. Yes. But um, the, the one, of the f one of the truths about the Big Dig, as, it was, uh, as its costs were getting out of control, was that we were, in effect, for 15 years, starving transportation and other infrastructure investments in other parts of the Commonwealth in order to pay for that project. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's only part of how we paid for the project. Mm -hmm. The other part of how we paid for the project was to borrow a whole lot of money and put the debt on the T and on the old turnpike. Uh, remember the turnpike right, authority. Yes. So um, it's, a it's a constraint in practical ways in our ability to um, keep up with the maintenance and the reasonable modest expansions we need to do in other parts of the Commonwealth. I'll give you an example. Last year when uh, we were engaged with the legislature on how to close a short-term uh, budget deficit at the T, um, we had to consider um, fare increases, service cuts, um, and also some, some additional short-term, one-year money from the, uh, from the legislature. And all of those things came into play. And w there were hoots and howls about um, limiting bus service, uh, a couple of bus lines, at certain times of the day. Mm -hmm. There are regional transit authorities that have not been able to supply buses on the weekends for years. Right. Um, because they, we can't and haven't kept up with their support. There are parts of the Commonwealth, the fourth and fifth largest cities, New Bedford and Fall River, that are completely cut off from the economic hub in the greater Boston area mm -hmm. because Route 24 is a parking lot during uh, uh, rush hour, and there is, no, uh, there is no train. There used to be, mm -hmm. um, but there is no, no train. In western Massachusetts, the economic orientation, you might be interested to, uh, to, to know, is much more north-south than east-west. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're trying to figure out how to get back and forth to Connecticut, New York, right. uh, and up to Vermont. So um, uh, a train line that connects western Massachusetts to, uh, to Grand Central Station is actually really, really important. Mm -hmm. In the same way that having access to broadband, which you take for granted here, right. but 123 communities in western Massachusetts have no uh, high-speed broadband. Um, that ends this year, but it was the state that invested in right. making that uh, possible. So um, what, we, what we have proposed is really about making sure that we are reinvesting um, equitably across the whole of the Commonwealth in the places that have been economically cut off so that folks have um, ways there too to get to job opportunities, to get to the doctor, to get to, gro to the grocery store, to recreate uh, and, the, uh, and the rest of it. And it seems only right that that would be a part of the vision for a 21st century transportation network. Right. So, Governor, someone whispered in my ear that you're a bit of a movie buff. <laughs> 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 Is that true? I like movies. Yeah. So we're in that we're in that that season of uh, award shows and all those kinds of things. Yeah. You want to offer any Don't any, you any reviews? They yes, I do. Uh, no. Actually, I do. They start on a Tuesday. <laughs> they end the next week. Exactly. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. So, what have you seen that you liked? I saw Lincoln hmm. three times. Hmm. Um, I'm uh, I'm going to see it one more time. I thought it I, I mean I, I was worried about it because mm -hmm. I'm I'm a I'm a great admirer of admirer of Lincoln and I think I was worried that it would it would make a cartoon of right. it. Um, but uh, Daniel Day Lewis was absolutely brilliant um, as was the rest of the cast. I thought it was really superb. I saw a peculiar movie called um, Beast of the Southern Beasts uh -huh, of the yes. Southern Wild. Have mm -hmm. you seen it? Mm -hmm. Really um, troubling. Um, an interesting uh, movie because the uh, actors were uh, were all amateurs. Yes. Um, very very powerful. Mm. So those are a couple. And 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 I, underst I understand that um, that um, you have a dog. I do. Who comes to the office? I hear from time to time. <laughs> who, who has been telling you all this stuff? <laughs> well, I I, I I learned yesterday that that your your dog's name is Toby, and right. I shared with this unnamed individual that that when I was growing up, I had a dog named. Named Toby. So Is tell us right? about the trips to the office. Was it a black lab? No. no. <laughs> no he's, a, he's a black lab. We've, we've always had dogs, my wife and I and the, and the kids, um, usually two. And uh, we lost the last one, um, a chocolate lab, uh, uh, three and a half years ago, hmm. maybe four years ago. And um, on possibly the worst day I have been in office. So hmm. it's like that was it. That was a terrible day. And then I'd come home hmm. and the dog 
is dying. Um, uh, the kids were gone or mostly gone at, at that point, and it seemed, given the pattern of our lives, that we should have a break. And uh, I came home one July day, about two weeks or so before my birthday, and um, and uh, my wife and kids had surprised me with an early birthday mm. gift. It was this absolutely adorable black lab with a huge head. He looks like a gun <laughs> toy or something <laughs> like that, a and totally loving and fabulous and um, my wife's thinking, she said, thinking is a term of <laughs> art here, uh, was that he would keep me company while I was recovering from having a hip replaced. Huh. I don't know if, if you know about the energy level of Labradors. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good thing yeah, to be right. trying to walk around when you're, when you're on, a, uh, on a new artificial hip, but uh, we are inseparable. Great, you know. thank you. Governor, thank you very much. It's good to be it's with you. It's been a real pleasure thank to, you to sit and have an opportunity to talk to you. Thanks thank for you very much. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. It's good to see you. Take care. Thank you very much for, for joining us for this conversation um, with the governor. Take care. this regularly or is it no no no, no. no. wow great well, there you go he was great yeah he was great I might have to, uh, he even gave me a little eye thing when it was when i was going on too long and it's time <laughs> to <laughs> wrap it up uh, that was that's what that was uh, <laughs> uh, so